Horror films come and go, but urban legends stick around forever. From the legend of the Candyman to the legend of the Skinwalkers, urban legends provide a terrifying insight into the paranormal and the unexplained. Sometimes these eerie urban legends end up being true. If you're traveling along the roads of western Pennsylvania at night, be on the lookout for an urban legend that locals call the Green Man. He's often seen walking along State Route 351, and he has no eyes, no nose, and no mouth, and a strange green glow to his skin. The legend has it that the Green Man was involved in an accident which led to his face and body looking very different from those around him. The story goes that the Green Man wanted to get a better look at a bird's nest. He climbed an electric pole and was shocked by the electricity. The shock was great enough to throw him from the pole, and when he landed on the ground, he lost both of his eyes, his nose, mouth, one ear, and one arm. His green skin is attributed to the electrical shocks that he suffered, and he was rumored by those living in western Pennsylvania to be living in an abandoned farmhouse away from the rest of society. He would only come out at night, believing that the darkness would keep him safe and prevent others from seeing him. The urban legend didn't hold much malevolence to it, but locals believed wholeheartedly that the Green Man was always lurking along State Route 351. It turns out that the Green Man is much more than an urban legend. He is a real person. The true identity of the Green Man was found to be Raymond Robinson, born in 1910 in Beaver County, Pennsylvania. Robinson was injured in a terrible accident involving a bird's nest and an electrical pole. Doctors did not expect Robinson to survive his injuries. The lines that he had touched carried currents containing 1,200 volts and 22,000 volts, but he defied expectations and survived. Much like the urban legend, Robinson was left without eyes, a nose, or a right arm. As he got older, he became more reclusive and shut himself off from the outside world, believing that he was a monster. Instead, he would walk at night as he believed that if people couldn't see his face, he wouldn't scare them. Most people were kind to Robinson, chatting with him and offering him cigarettes and beers. After a while, Robinson became a local celebrity and people would flock from all over the state to get a glimpse at the man they called Charlie No-Face. Sadly, not everyone who came across Robinson treated him with respect. People were known to physically assault him and even ran him over with their car at one point. Robinson's nephew told HistoryDaily.org, quote, He never discussed his injuries or his problems at all. It was just a reality and there was nothing he could do about it, so he never spoke about it. He never complained about anything. Raymond Robinson passed away in 1985 at age 74. While he may be gone now, his story will live on forever. The urban legend and creepypasta titled The Alice Killings is a legend about a supposed serial killer that was active between 1999 and 2005 in Japan. The story claims that these crimes are amongst the most bizarre that Japanese police have ever come across, and to this day, they've never been solved. They're called the Alice Killings because at each of the five crime scenes, a playing card was left with the word Alice written on them. While this is a creepy story with plenty of lore to sink your teeth into, the story is based on a real-life case. In the urban legend, all of the victims were abducted and reported missing by their friends and family. A huge search was undertaken to find the Alice victims, only for them to be found days later with the playing card. The killer left behind little to no evidence, and this is how the urban legend began. The inspiration for the Alice Killings urban legend comes from the playing card killer. The killer, named Alfredo, was active in Spain between January and March of 2003. He seemingly chose his victims at random and would shoot them before fleeing the scene, but that wasn't before leaving behind an ominous playing card. His second victim, Juan Carlos Martin, Estacio, was found on February 5th with an ace near his body. At first, police believed this was just a coincidence. However, a month later, on March 7th, another victim was found, with yet another playing card by their body. The media latched onto the story and sensationalized the fact that cards had been left behind at the crime scene. He would go on to claim six more victims and injure three others. His spree was over on July 3rd, 2003 when he handed himself in to police and confessed to being the elusive playing card killer, telling them, quote, I wanted to know what it felt like to kill. 
He was sentenced to 142 years in prison and became the inspiration for one of the creepiest urban legends. For those who are based in Canada, you may have heard the story of a lawyer who had a penchant for throwing himself against the glass of his office windows to show his employees just how strong they were. Different versions of this story are told all around the world, but the basic details remain the same. According to the urban legend, the lawyer would frequently run into the glass windows to show everyone how strong they were and that he would always be protected. However, one day, one of the windows gave way and caused the lawyer to fall multiple floors before hitting the ground. Sadly, this urban legend is derived from a true story of Toronto lawyer Gary Hoy. 39-year-old Hoy was a senior partner at Holden Day Wilson Law Firm. The company was based on the 24th floor of Toronto's TD Centre and Hoy would frequently entertain colleagues by running at the windows to demonstrate how strong and safe they were. On July 9, 1993, Hoy would perform this party trick for the last time. As law students entered the firm's office for work experience, Hoy wanted to put on a show. He ran at the window and body checked it, and much to the amazement of the students, nothing happened. He ran at the window for a second time, and the glass popped out of the frame, causing Hoy to fall 24 floors. Newspapers in Toronto covered the bizarre news story as it unfolded, and to this day, they still do. The Toronto Star even consulted a structural engineer who wrote, quote, I don't know of any building code in the world that would allow a 160-pound man to run up against a glass and it be able to withstand it. Colleagues at Holden Day Wilson Law Firm described Hoy as one of our best and brightest. There are a few iterations of the Bunny Man urban legend because the story was passed around by word of mouth during the 1970s in Fairfax County, Virginia. Those in Fairfax are warned about never venturing to Colchester Overpass on Colchester Road as they might be visited by the Bunny Man. The story says that in 1904, a bus full of patients from a nearby mental hospital were being transported to another facility after residents of Clifton expressed their concerns about having such a facility so close to their community. The residents were horrified to learn that the bus tasked with transporting the patients had been involved in a crash and one of them had escaped. The patient was rumored to have been surviving on rabbits and had left their remains near the Colchester overpass. The legend of the Bunny Man takes a dark turn on Halloween evening when a group of adults were hanging out near the overpass. According to the legend, the group saw a bright orb of light and within seconds they had been attacked by the escaped mental patient who from then on was known as the Bunny Man. The Bunny Man legend became reality on October 19, 1970, when cadet Robert Bennett and his fiance were on Genny Road in Fairfax County, Virginia. At around midnight, the pair returned to their car after visiting a relative who lived close by. According to Bennett, he'd parked the car in a field as the relative they were visiting lived just across the way. As he started the car, he saw something moving behind them, before they had a moment to process what they had just seen, their windscreen was hit by a hatchet, smashing into thousands of pieces. All the while, the couple were frozen in fear in their seats. Bennett recalled seeing a man dressed in a white suit, complete with bunny ears. He screamed at them, You're on private property and I have your tag number. As the couple sped away, they saw that there was a hatchet on the floor of their car. After speaking with friends and family, they were informed that they'd just encountered the infamous bunny man. Ten days later, on October 29th, the bunny man was spotted again, this time by a security guard, Paul Phillips. Phillips worked as a security guard for a construction business that was building homes in the area. According to Phillips, he was carrying out his rounds as usual when he saw a man standing in the doorway of an unfinished lot. He described the man as 5 foot 8, 175 pounds, and wearing a black, gray, and white bunny suit. As Phillips got closer, he realized the man was swinging a long-handled axe at the porch of the unfinished home. Phillips told him to put down the axe and leave, but he was met with an ominous reply when the bunny man opened his mouth and said, You're trespassing. If you come any closer, I'll chop off your head. The bunny man was estimated to be in his early 20s, and despite a full investigation, the Fairfax Police Department were unable to confirm his identity. All they know is that the bunny man is quite possibly still out there. The horror film The Candyman 
has cemented itself as one of the creepiest films to ever grace our screens, and also gave birth to a terrifying urban legend that is steeped in truth. In the film, the Candyman is summoned by saying his name five times while looking into a mirror before the mysterious figure appears behind you. Following the film's release, the legend of the Candyman only grew in popularity with young people daring each other to this day to say his name in a mirror. What the film didn't mention is that the Candyman's appearance through the bathroom mirror is based on a true story by Ruthie McCoy. On April 22, 1987, Ruthie McCoy dialed 911 and requested police presence at her apartment on Chicago's South Side. Ruthie explained that someone had broken into her apartment through her bathroom mirror, saying, I'm a resident at 1440 West 13th Street, and some people next door are totally tearing this down. They threw the cabinet down. Chicago police arrived at Ruthie's apartment, but were hesitant to break down her front door in case she would later sue them for damages. Instead, they knocked and waited for 10 to 15 minutes. After there was no response, they left. Ruthie's neighbors confirmed to police that they'd heard gunshots coming from Ruthie's apartment, but this did little to change their minds. It wasn't until two days later when the building manager removed the lock to Ruthie's apartment that her body was discovered. Police believe that Ruthie's story about the perpetrator coming in through the bathroom was a wild story made out by a woman who was paranoid. However, Ruthie was right. The Alba apartments, which she'd been staying in, had small passageways between each apartment that allowed janitors just enough room to perform maintenance work. These passages also allowed criminals to gain access to people's apartments by pushing in the medicine cabinets in the bathroom. According to the Chicago Tribune, these cabinets were held in place with just six nails and were easily dislodged. An excerpt from the same article reads, quote, Everyone knows you can slither from one apartment to the adjacent one through the pipe chase, about two and a half feet across between the cabinets. In some areas of the building, you can even climb vertically into the pipe chase into an apartment either above or below the one you started in. La Segua is a creepy figure of Central American legend and folklore. It seems to have its origins in colonial times, and stories of the monster were brought over from Spain and adapted to local audiences. As with many legends, the circumstances of the creature can change wildly, as the message behind the story is more important than the story itself. La Segua appears as a beautiful woman to men traveling alone at night. She appears exhausted and will ask for a ride to the closest town. The men are drawn by her beauty or a supernatural charm and agree to take her. Once in the vehicle or in colonial times on the horse, the woman transforms into a hideous creature with the skull of a horse for a head. The man will either pass away from fright or will become a broken shell of a person for the rest of their life. In other versions of the story, her head remains human in form but covered in rotting meat or hair. She takes the lives of men with a kiss. The story is supposed to stop men from stopping off at taverns on their way from work and encouraging them to stay faithful and not give in to impure thoughts about vulnerable young women. But it's not only a warning for men. The origin of La Segua varies a lot, but all stories involve a young woman behaving improperly. In the most famous version of the story, the creature was once a beautiful woman of Spanish and native descent. She fell in love with a Spanish officer who tricked her into behaving in an improper way. He broke her heart and then returned to Spain. After he vanished, the woman went insane and transformed into a monster, forever destined to take revenge on men. Other stories have the woman as a terrible woman who neglected her children and is somewhat similar to the famous story of La Llorona. She's also said to have been cursed by her own mother when she tried to strike her mother for not letting her go to a party. It seems the only way to definitively stop La Segua is to avoid traveling alone. In some versions of the legend, throwing mustard seeds at the creature can help. She'll stop to pick up the seeds, giving her victim enough time to escape.
Bodies being inside of a building is a common legend around the world. The subjects of the legend range from famous landmarks to local buildings, used to explain disappearances near building sites. Australia is not immune from the morbid myth, and one of the most famous structures is said to be the final resting place of many workers. Sydney Harbour Bridge is one of the biggest construction projects in the world, at least in the 20th century. It was nicknamed the Iron Lung because the project kept so many people employed during the Great Depression. When the bridge was opened in 1932, nine years after construction began, it was cause for great celebration. At the time, there was little mention of the tragedies that had helped make the construction possible. Two months later, with little ceremony, a plaque was placed above the steps on the south side of the bridge, listing the 16 men who lost their lives during construction. But according to urban legends, three names are missing. The story goes that three men wound up inside of one of the pylons. In some stories, they fell in during construction, but the officials did not want to halt work to retrieve the bodies, and the three men were entombed inside. In other stories, the men sought shelter from the heat inside and spent the night drinking and smoking. The next morning, when they lay sleeping, the pylon was capped and the men were trapped. It was a few days before anyone realized the men were missing, and the overseers realized what had happened. They petitioned the officials to allow them to reopen the pylon to retrieve the bodies, but it was deemed too costly. This wasn't the end of the story, though. The men's spirits allegedly lingered in the area. Workers would pour alcohol over the edge to appease them, but it wasn't enough. A number of the confirmed deaths are said to be caused by the spirits, including that of Henry Waters, who passed away in April of 1926. Officially, he passed away in a quarry crash, but according to the stories, the incident was much more inexplicable. Sudden high winds caused the crane he was operating to destabilize. He got out and began running to safety when he became rooted to the spot beneath the heavy stone he had been lifting. Then the rope snapped. Henry was allegedly the crane operator who'd capped the pylon. The story was almost definitely embellished over the years, but whether there's any truth to the three unidentified men being trapped in the famous landmark remains a mystery. There's something about empty subway stations or other underground stations that's particularly eerie. Even something as simple as catching the last train of the night from an active subway station can leave a commuter feeling uneasy. Perhaps it's the fact they're designed to be busy, so the lack of people stands out. But a subway station that's no longer in use takes the creepy factor to another level. Add in a creepy urban legend about an unexplained ghost, and the Lower Bay subway station in Toronto manages to become one of the most chilling stations in the world. The Lower Bay station sits directly below Bay Station, which is still an active and busy part of Toronto's transit system. On the surface, visitors likely don't notice the few signs that another station lies just a few meters below them. The tiling on the walls is slightly mismatched as it's hard to cover the entrance to the lower platform, and the doors that still lead down there look just like any other service door. The lower platform was opened at the same time as the upper station but it was part of a short-lived experiment to connect different lines. The experiment was abandoned after just six months, allegedly because passengers found the new layouts too confusing. Today, the station is used for training and turning trains around when necessary. It has also been featured in numerous films that feature subway stations, often dressed up to resemble a New York City station. But Toronto Transit Commission workers claim there's something else living down there. The lady in red, as she's been dubbed, is the spirit of a woman dressed in red. She has no legs or not any that have been seen, and instead glides along the tracks. Some sources also say she has no eyes, and workers that have seen her 
refused to return to the tunnels where she was witnessed. Others have felt drafts where they said it's not natural for a draft to be, or cold spots that left them filled with anxiety or dread. Orbs have also been witnessed. Who the woman is remains unknown. It's been suggested it might be the spirit of someone who jumped or was pushed in front of a train during the station's short life, but there's no record of such an incident taking place. Other sources have reported the station was built on the site of an old potter's field, a graveyard for the poor. The people that were laid out to rest in the cemetery were all moved before the building took place, but perhaps the lady in red's remains were left behind. For now, the spirit seems to be confined to the lower platform, and there are no reports of her trying to make herself known to passengers on the busy subway line. This chilling story sounds like a work of fiction, and while many people dismiss it as just that, others insist the legend is true. In Philadelphia, there is allegedly a bus unlike any other. From the outside, it looks like any other city bus, but it does not display a destination and cannot be found on any of the transit maps in the city. Waiting at a bus stop for it to come will get you nowhere. The only way to get on the bus is if the entity deems you worthy. The bus to nowhere, as it's been called, appears only to people at the lowest point in their lives. These people are filled with such despair that they cannot imagine living another day. While walking alone on a Philadelphia street at night, they'll see a bus pass them, which for some reason, they know will take them wherever they want to be. If you ignore the bus, you will not get a chance, but if you try to flag it down, the bus will stop and you can get on board. Most people forget everything that happens after this point. But the people who have retained their memories say no fare was requested and the driver simply gestured for them to sit down. The new passenger joined a number of others all sat on the bus in silent contemplation. If they gaze out the window, they will see nothing. While they are aware that the bus is moving and there is a world outside, it cannot be seen. For hours, the passengers will reflect on everything that's led them to feel this despair. They deconstruct what has happened, what they did wrong, and what they could have done differently. It's only when everything has been laid out in their minds that the passenger can move on from the grief and despair they've been feeling. At that moment, city lights will be visible outside, and the passenger can pull the cord. The bus comes to a stop at the same place where the passenger got on board. Some passengers have reported, even though they experienced only hours, Weeks or months have gone past in the real world. Others have said they've been able to go back and make amends for the mistakes they previously made. All those who have reported being on the bus, whether they remember what happened or not, said their lives turned around afterwards. The story sounds too strange to be true and first arrived on the internet in 2011. The author said it was a work of fiction, but many people claim otherwise, and it's possible it has more truth than even the author knew. Flat Bridge in Jamaica is one of the oldest bridges in the country and one of the most dangerous. Built using slave labor in the 18th century, an unknown number of slaves lost their lives during construction. Ever since, the water below has apparently demanded sacrifices and motorists and pedestrians alike have lost their lives here. The bridge is located in St. Catherine's Parish. It's on a relatively busy route, but the bridge itself is only a single lane and traffic is managed with lights. Many attribute the high accident rate on the bridge to careless driving, and that almost certainly plays a part. Impatient travelers have been known to skip the queues at lights and try to cut across the bridge while vehicles are coming in the other direction but many locals believe something more sinister is afoot. For a start, many of the accidents may have been less tragic if something like railings were placed on the sides of the bridge. But each time such a structure has been put in place, heavy storms have washed them away. This is said to be the work of the River Mama, a mermaid that lives below the bridge. 
According to creepy legends, when the river water turns a bright green, that indicates a mermaid wants a sacrifice and an accident is soon to occur. Cars will stop working for no apparent reason or are otherwise pulled into the water where rescuers have been unable to save the occupants. Once the mermaid has had her meal, the water returns to normal and the accidents stop. One resident, a man referred to as Roaster, showed his relatives a giant fish scale he claimed came from the mermaid. He told them that he was going to catch it. Roaster then drowned in the river. When his remains were found, it was discovered that he had broken a hand and his neck, and a string of fish had been tied to his shorts. His neighbors blamed the mermaid. Also, supposedly lingering around the bridge are the ghosts of slaves who passed away during construction. They have also been blamed for some of the accidents. Around Easter time in 1901, Captain Dimitrios Kontos and his crew of sponge divers were diving near the Greek island of Antikythera, where they were gathering natural sponges intended for human use. They were traveling to the fishing waters of North Africa when they decided to stop and wait for more favorable weather. While they waited, they decided to dive off the coast, and one of the men reached a depth of 148 feet when he signaled for his shipmates to pull him back up. When he reached the surface, he reported what he had found and what seemed to be a mass grave containing human and horse bones. Assuming that the diver was drunk from the nitrogen in his breathing mix, another diver decided to look for himself and he dove down. A few minutes later, he resurfaced holding the bronze arm of a statue. They soon left the area as planned but returned at the end of the season to collect more of the hidden treasure. Inside of a sunken ship, they found many artifacts including coins and statues dating back to the 4th century BC. But the most remarkable discovery was that of the Antikythera mechanism. It was discovered that the mechanism is the oldest example of a mechanical model of our solar system. It would have been used long ago to predict the position of the stars and eclipses, often decades in advance. Various other small artifacts were also discovered, but when one diver passed away and two other divers suffered paralysis due to decompression sickness, work at the site ceased. In May of the following year, an archaeologist was studying the artifacts at the National Archaeological Museum when he noticed that a piece of bronze which had been found contained a gear wheel and Greek inscriptions so the purpose of the Antikythera mechanism was finally discovered. Another study in 2016 revealed more inscriptions on the front of the cover of the device that make reference to the years 462 and 442. The ancient Greek calculations for the celestial periods of Venus and Saturn. Many attempts are being made to recreate a working version of the device and it's currently on display at the National Archaeological Museum in Athens. In Taizhou, located in China, construction workers were put to work on a road that needed to be widened in 2011. While they were excavating the site, they hit a large solid object about five and a half feet below the surface, and knowing that it wasn't supposed to be there, they immediately stopped working. They contacted a team of archaeologists from the Taizhou Museum who started further excavation of the site. To their surprise, they found that the construction workers had inadvertently stumbled onto a tomb. As they excavated further, they found that the tomb contained a coffin which was constructed in three layers. The innermost section was lined with silk and linens, which were covered in a brown liquid. Beneath linens and silk, they found the perfectly preserved mummy of a female. The body had been so perfectly preserved that the woman's eyebrows, forehead, skin, hair, clothing, and jewelry were still intact. The clothing was found to be made of silk and cotton, two materials that are usually very difficult to preserve. When archaeologists studied the mummy, they could not determine whether the brown liquid was added to the coffin on purpose or whether it was groundwater that had seeped in over time. 
They did discover, however, that the oxygen level and temperature of the liquid were perfect for preservation, as it was not conducive of bacterial growth and it slowed down decomposition of the body. Other ancient artifacts found in the coffin include a jade ring, a silver hairpin, and over 20 items of clothing that date back to the Ming Dynasty, which lasted from 1368 to 1644. They also found ceramics, ancient writings, and a silver hairpin, which is known to have been a typical decorative item during the Ming Dynasty. It has not been determined how old the woman was at the time of her passing, but her face is free of wrinkles, and so it's assumed she was quite young, though definitely an adult. Due to the fine clothes and jewelry in the coffin, along with the method used for mummification, it's believed that the woman, who stood just five feet tall, was a high-ranking member of the Ming Dynasty. She's currently on display at the Taizhou Museum. In August of 1987, Brian Campbell from East London had dug up a tree stump in his garden. He was in the process of filling in the hole when his shovel hit something solid in the soil, and he unexpectedly stumbled on an ancient artifact. As he uncovered the object and removed the soil from it, he noticed that it had a strange shape and that it was similar to a baseball. He states that he thought it was beautifully made and assumed it must have been a measuring tool that was used by blacksmiths. He cleaned the object and placed it on his kitchen windowsill. It would remain there for the next 10 years before he learned what he had actually discovered. When he visited the Roman Fort and Archaeological Park in Germany, he approached a glass display and, to his surprise, saw an identical object inside. He then realized that what he had found was a Roman dodecahedron, a 12-sided hollow metal ball containing a hole in each of the 12 sides along with a metal knob on each of the faces. He also learned that archaeologists had been trying to figure out what the exact purpose of the ball was, but they remain baffled. The first of these dodecahedrons was found nearly 300 years ago, in a field next to some ancient coins. Since then, more than 100 of these objects have been found at dozens of sites across northern Europe. Some are as small as a golf ball, while others are larger, about the size of a tennis ball. They can be found on display in various museums across Europe, but no one has been able to figure out what they were used for. No written documentation has been found to explain their purpose, and so many theories have been put forward. Some people believe they were military banner ornaments. Some think that they were candle holders, while others have speculated that they might have been used as props and used during magic spells. It's also been suggested that they may be a type of rangefinder, or perhaps something as simple as a child's toy. In 1999, Henry Westfall and Mario Renner were out using their metal detectors in Middleburg Hill in eastern Germany, when they discovered a hidden treasure that was completely out of place. What they found was a bronze disc just under 12 inches in diameter inlaid with gold shapes and symbols. Along with the disc, they also found two hatchets, two bronze swords, a chisel, and pieces of a bracelet. They knew that any artifacts that were found in the area legally belonged to the state, and since they didn't have an archaeological license, it would be illegal for them to keep them. They dug the disc up, damaging it in the process, and sold their entire find to a dealer in Cologne the next day. During the next two years, it made its way to Germany after being sold for about $600,000, and in 2001, its existence became public knowledge. When it was finally inspected properly, it was dated to around 1600 BC, and it is believed that the inlays represent the sun or full moon, a crescent moon, and stars. Popular theories state that the object was used as an astronomical instrument and that it had religious significance. It was also found that the disc was most likely not part of the rest of the hidden treasure found at the site, as it was located about three inches above the rest of the trove. 
meaning that it would be much younger than the rest of the artifacts. Many people believed at first that the disc was an archaeological forgery, as its discovery seemed fantastical, but when a fragment of gold that perfectly fit a missing piece on the disc was found in the same area, it was accepted by most to be genuine. Currently, the disc is on exhibition at the Halley State Museum of Prehistory, and a multimedia visitor center has been opened at the site of its initial discovery on Middleburg Hill. Royal Australian Air Force radar operator Maury Eisenberg was stationed north of continental Australia at the Second World War as it raged on in 1944. During his time there, he was in the habit of relaxing and fishing on a beach in Jensen Bay, and on one such occasion, he stumbled across a hidden treasure. In the sand, he found nine old coins, four of them of Dutch origin and the other five from an area in Tanzania. Not knowing what they really were, he initially tried to sell them but he was unsuccessful. For the next few decades, he put them away until he decided to send them to a museum to be identified in 1979. When the coins were inspected, it was found that they were over 900 years old, giving rise to the baffling question of how they got there since James Cook only discovered Australia in 1770. A professor at the Indiana Purdue University theorizes that rock art found on the islands, which seems to depict a European sailing vessel, may hold some clues and that the coins will have to be compared to indigenous rock art to glean more information. Some theories suggest that since European ships sailed along the coasts of Australia in the 1600s, long before Cook's arrival, they may have washed ashore after a shipwreck off the coast. Others have posited that parts of northern Australia may have been visited by sailors from as far away as the Middle East and Africa, and that the coins made their way there on their ships. Some people have also spoken of an Indonesian shipwreck survivor who lived on the islands. He may have been one of the ones who brought the coins to the beach where Eisenberg stumbled upon them. It's believed that the coins may have represented the man's worldly wealth. An expedition was led to the spot where the coins were found, helped by the fact that Eisenberg drew a map to remember the exact location. But no other artifacts were found. It's believed that the coins would have been circulated for a few hundred years, but only in or around East Africa. Beyond that, no other clues have been uncovered to explain why the coins were in an area so far out of place. Other coins, which are similar in appearance, have been found in Zimbabwe and in the UAE, but other than on a beach in northern Australia, no others have surfaced and their journey there remains a mystery. The Hellfire Club is an abandoned building constructed in 1725 by William Connolly, the Speaker of the Irish House of Commons, originally intended to be a hunting lodge. He named it Mount Pelier, but it has also been called the Haunted House, the Kennel, and Connolly's Folly. It was just one of many establishments that were known by the name Hellfire Club in Ireland and Britain during the 19th century, this one being located in Dublin. Before the lodge was built, the site featured a passage grave with a cairn on top of the hill, but Connolly had the cairn demolished in order to establish the lodge. When building commenced, he used a standing stone from the cairn as a lintel for the fireplace, and when the lodge's roof was blown off some time later, many people believe it was caused by the spirits seeking revenge for the demolished cairn. After he passed away, the building was sold and it became a meeting place for the Hellfire Club, founded in 1735 by Richard Parsons, who was known to dabble in black magic. The club was intended for members who enjoyed the more sordid side of life, and they often took part in all sorts of strange behaviors. Members of the club included the fourth Baron Barry, Simon Luttrell, who was the first Earl of Carrington, Colonel Henry Ponsby, Colonel Richard St. George, and Colonel Clements. It's said that members would partake of a drink called scalphine, which is a mixture of whiskey and hot butter and that a chair was always left open in case the devil showed up. 
The members were also known to be keen practical jokers, and on one occasion, a joke went too far, leading to the accidental demise of a maid known as Suki. It's said that she still haunts the caves where she passed away. Another tale claims that on one occasion, a stranger had joined the men for a game of cards. At one point, one of the men dropped a card, and as he leaned under the table to retrieve it, he noticed that the stranger had cloven hooves instead of feet. Bangar Fort in India is listed as one of the most haunted locations in the country, and one of the scariest places on earth. It was built in the 17th century, when Bangar was a growing and flourishing town. Today, visitors to the fort are urged by the Archaeological Survey of India to leave the ruins before nightfall, and signage posted in the vicinity warn over and over again that it's prohibited to enter the area before sunrise and after sunset. During its prime, it's believed that over 10,000 people inhabited the town before it was hastily abandoned overnight. Legend has it that the land on which the fort is built once belonged to an influential man named Guru Balu Nath. Mato Singh asked permission from the Guru to construct the fort on his land, as it was intended for Singh's son. The Guru agreed, but on one condition. The shadow of the fort was never to fall over his house, or severe tragedy would ensue. But failing to heed his warnings, Singh's successor decided to fortify the building by extending its walls upwards, and the building's shadow darkened the Guru's home. A great curse then befell the whole of Bengar, and the residents fled in the night, never to return again. Another legend has it that a beautiful princess of Bengar named Ratnavati caught the eye of a necromancer and he fell in love with her. He put a spell on her massage oil, but before the oil was used, she caught wind of his plan and smashed the oil jar on a boulder. The magic backfired and the boulder rolled onto the necromancer, crushing him beneath its weight. Before he succumbed, he used his last breath to lay a curse on the entire town which would cause it to slowly succumb to abandonment, just as he had. The following year, Bengar's army suffered a heavy defeat at the hands of an enemy, and the inhabitants of the town were done away with. Since that day, Princess Ratnavati is said to still roam the ruins among the screams and pleas for help from the people that lived there long ago. About 70 miles west of Belize city, lay the ruins of Shunan Tunis. It's built on top of a ridge above a river where it served as a Maya civic ceremonial center during the late and terminal classic periods when the Belize Valley was inhabited by over 200,000 people. The most famous structure is known as El Castillo, a pyramid-shaped temple which is the second highest building in Belize. It stands at 130 feet tall and its walls are adorned with stone carvings that depict stories of the Maya people who used to live in the area. The ruins were discovered in the late 1800s, and some areas are still undergoing excavation today, with many other palaces, temples, and abandoned structures being found. Construction shows that the temple was built in two stages, the first being constructed around 800 AD, and the second being added some time later. In 2016, a team of archaeologists uncovered an untouched burial chamber connected to another, larger structure. When it was excavated, they found that it was one of the largest Mayan burial chambers that had been discovered during the last century. Inside, they found the remains of a 20 to 30 year old man, along with other artifacts that included ceramic jugs, sharpened blades, animal bones, jade pearls, and other stone objects. When the man's remains were inspected more closely, it was found that he was athletic and muscular when he passed away. The word Shunan Tunish means Maiden of the Rock or Stone Woman, though this is a modern name given to the site as its original name remains unknown. This new name refers to a ghost unlike those found in your average haunted house, which is said to dwell there and she features so prominently in the area that it was thought fitting to name it after her. Many people have told stories of their strange experiences here, reporting that the woman, dressed completely in white, appears in front of the abandoned temple pyramid, 
She then walks slowly down the stone stairs that lead from the abandoned structure with eyes that glow red like embers before disappearing into a nearby wall. Eden Brown Estate is located in the island country of Nevis in the Caribbean. It was built in 1740 by James Brown Sr., who developed the land around it as a sugar mill. His son would go on to make upgrades to the property, but due to the tropical weather, he would often become ill and was ultimately forced to relocate to North America. This left the estate in the hands of his sister, Elizabeth White, in 1797. She would eventually sell the estate to a Scottish-Irish businessman named Edward Huggins, who managed to grow the 200-acre land into a profitable sugar enterprise. When his daughter, Julia, was at an age where she was to marry, he upgraded the state even further in order to impress the Maynard family that was just as wealthy as he was. He filled it with African furniture, Chinese silverware, and dishes and edible delicacies that were brought from all over the world. These efforts were made due to the fact that if the two families were to unite, they would hold a massive amount of power and status in Nevis. But not everyone saw it as the utopia that Huggins made it out to be. He would be brought to trial by England after it was discovered that he was a cruel slave master, and his trial is considered to be a landmark case that led to the emancipation of slaves in Nevis in 1833. But the estate would eventually be abandoned after a feud broke out between John Huggins and Walter Maynard. Maynard noticed that Huggins treated his slaves badly and confronted him about the matter on Julia's wedding day. An argument broke out and Maynard threw his drink at Huggins, splashing him in the face. This enraged him and he challenged Maynard to a duel. And after Maynard accepted, they stepped out onto the estate's courtyard with their weapons drawn. It's believed that the men intended to merely blow off some steam by firing into the air, but they both took aim at each other and ended the other's life. This incident led to the abandonment of the estate and its subsequent ruin as it stands today. Many people believe that Julia spent her remaining days in solitude and slowly went insane. It's been reported that the abandoned house is now haunted as Julia is often seen on nights with a full moon walking on the steps of the estate while wearing a tattered wedding gown. Others that have camped on the grounds have reported hearing the pained screams of a woman coming from inside the ruins. The Kempton Park Hospital, located in South Africa, has been abandoned since 1996. The last activity seen in its halls was a Christmas party held for staff that year and since then it has stood empty without explanation. Many locals consider it to be one of the scariest places on earth as they've experienced some inexplicable and unnerving events while exploring the defunct building. Plans were made by the South African government and the Department of Health to start renovations at a cost of $16.8 million in March of 2013. But no work has been done and the hospital stands as it has for decades, decaying and deserted. When it was opened in 1978, it was one of the best medical facilities in the country. But today, its floors are stained with biological matter. Expensive medical equipment stands covered in dust. Broken wheelchairs litter the halls, and dirty hospital beds stand empty. People who were born in the hospital are known to bribe security guards in order to find their birth records, which are strewn amongst x-rays and other medical documentation that has long since been forgotten. Many people have reported that the building is not as empty as it seems at first glance though. Those who have explored the hospital feel like they're being followed around by shadows and that if you listen closely, voices seem to emanate from the walls. Others say they've heard the cries of past patients calling out for help and that the spirit of a mysterious man walks through the halls. Babies have been heard crying in the maternity ward, and some explorers report that photos taken in the building seem to be obscured by a strange white sheen. Doors have been seen to open and close of their own accord, and it's said that a strange smell seems to permeate the air. 
following explorers around as they make their way through the debris scattered on the floors and operating tables. Paranormal investigators have since been banned from entering the abandoned facility. But since security is lax, there are still those brave enough to venture inside in search of the spirits that are said to dwell there. Since the mid-1700s, the Seminole people of Florida have spoken about a creature they called Tall Man, also known as Skunk Ape, a term that was coined back in the 1960s. When residential construction began in the area in the 1970s, more sightings of the creature were reported, most of those in the Palm Beach area, described as being around 7 feet tall with reddish-brown hair and weighing an estimated 400 to 500 pounds. The skunk ape is said to smell strongly of a wet dog, a skunk, rotten eggs, or any combination of the three. The very first published report of a skunk ape sighting occurred in Sewanee County, east of Tallahassee in 1942. A man reported that he was driving down the road when the creature jumped out onto the running board of his car. He claimed that the creature clung to the side of his vehicle for half a mile before jumping off and running back into the woods. Another sighting in 1957 came from three men that were hunting in the Big Cypress National Reserve east of Naples, nearly 400 miles away from the first sighting. All three men reported that the skunk ape invaded their campsite, and since then, there have been hundreds more sightings of the creature. Dave Sheely, owner of the Skunk Ape Research Center, says that he saw one of the creatures for the first time when he was nine years old. His father had found a set of massive footprints not too long before, and on this day, Dave's brother spotted it first while they were hunting in the area. He describes that the creature looked like a man but was completely covered with hair. On the 9th of January, 1974, Richard Lee Smith reported to police that he'd struck something with his car while driving near the intersection of US Route 27. He thought at first that he'd hit a tall man wearing dark clothing, but to his surprise, a seven-foot hairy creature stood up, roared at him, and charged his vehicle. He immediately took off, but for the next few hours, reports came in of sightings of a limping giant walking along Route 27. Police investigated and the patrolman reported seeing a hairy creature limping along the road before disappearing into the brush. But sightings still occur today. In 2000, an anonymous letter was mailed to Sarasota's Sheriff's Department containing two creepy photographs of what the sender believed to be an escaped orangutan that had stolen apples from their porch. When the photo was inspected more closely, it was found to depict a primate that looked nothing like an orangutan, but something much more akin to the skunk ape. The legend of the Maryland Goatman originated from two different tales. The first claims that it was once a man, but after his flock was destroyed by teenagers, he went mad and transformed into the legendary beast. Another claims that a scientist working at the Beltsville Agricultural Research Center was performing research on a goat when one of his experiments backfired and he was transformed into a half-man, half-goat. The creature is described as having the face of a human, but body covered in hair. On its head, they're said to grow a pair of horns with which it aggressively attacks vehicles that drive close by. Some legends hold that it walks with an axe in hand, looking for any unsuspecting prey that may come across its path. A man known only as Ryan claims to have had one of these mysterious creature sightings with two creepy photos as proof. He was attending the GRC Summit in the District of Columbia, and on the 23rd of March, 2016, he was playing tennis at a nearby park. As he was packing up to leave, he and his friends saw something at the edge of the forest at the park's border. He quickly took out his phone to take a photo, and as he got ready to do so, the creature stood up on two feet. This surprised him as he was sure that it was a goat. A few moments later, it dropped down to all fours again and disappeared into the thick woods. Ryan says that he was about 30 yards away from the creature and even from a distance, he could tell that it was about seven feet tall when standing on its hind legs. When he recounted his experience to others later on, 
they told him about the legend of the Goat Man, and he contacted a Baltimore news agency. But he was told that it looked like a bear holding a goat. Ryan insists, however, that what he saw was neither a bear nor a goat. The first reported sighting of a Mothman occurred on the 15th of November, 1966. Two couples, Roger and Linda Scarberry, along with Steve and Mary Mallet, reported to police that they saw a large gray creature with glowing red eyes in the headlights of their car while driving in the TNT area of Maryland. At first, they didn't know what to make of it, but when the creature started following their vehicle, they noticed that it had a human body with 10-foot-long wings. Over the next few days, more sightings of the creature were reported with two volunteer firemen describing it as a large bird with red eyes. George Johnson, the Mason County Sheriff at the time, stated that he believed the creature to be a large heron called a shitepoke. One man went as far as to blame the creature for a buzzing noise coming from his television and the disappearance of his German Shepherd. In September of 2020, a United States Postal Service veteran of 15 years reported that she was walking to her car after finishing her shift when she saw a man in an oversized coat staring at her. When she unlocked her vehicle, the headlights fell on the man and she realized that it was, in fact, a red-eyed creature standing about seven feet tall and what she thought was a coat was actually a pair of wings. The creature screeched at her, ran towards her and took to the sky, causing her to flee in her car. But in 2016, a man from Point Pleasant managed to capture a creepy photo of the creature. He was driving along State Route 2 when he saw something jump from tree to tree next to the road. He pulled over to take some photos and realized that it had human legs and wings with pointed tips. Some believe that sightings of the Mothman are a bad omen and that disasters are imminent after each sighting. Many claim that the Mothman was seen right before the collapse of the Point Pleasant Silver Bridge in 1967. Hook Island is located off the coast of Queensland, Australia and is known for being an excellent snorkeling and diving destination due to the coral growths that are found there. But it also has a mysterious legend connected to it, that of the Hook Island monster. The first sighting and photograph of the monster was reported in March of 1965 by a man named Robert Lasarek. The previous year, he and his family were on vacation with a friend on the Whitsunday Islands, part of which is made up by Hook Island. The family was out on the water in a motorboat, and as they crossed a bay off the coast of Hook Island, they spotted a dark shape under the surface of the water, close to the bay floor. Upon closer inspection, they saw that it was a tadpole-like creature, partially covered with sand. They estimated that it was about 30 feet long, and as they approached, Robert managed to get the mysterious creature sighting on camera. Summoning all of his courage, he ventured into the water to try and film the creature. But as he got closer, he realized it was much bigger than they thought at first, and he estimated it to be about 70 feet long. He thought that the creature might be dead as it wasn't moving, but as he approached, it opened its huge mouth and started swimming towards him. He noticed that the creature's tail was damaged, possibly by a ship propeller, and that the head was at least four feet from top to bottom, with jaws about four feet wide. He also claims to have noted that its skin was similar to that of a shark before he swam back to the boat as quickly as he could. He and the rest of his crew then watched in astonishment as it swam away and left the bay. Many people believe that Robert faked the photo and that he was, in fact, a known con man who was wanted by Interpol. But many others hold fast that the monster is indeed real and swims beneath the waters of Hook Bay to this day. A local tourist in the Changbai Mountain claims to have been lucky enough to get a creature sighting caught on camera in 2005. 52-year-old Zhang Chenchun was hiking in the western side of the mountain with his daughter and son-in-law when they saw a strange black object break the surface of the water in the middle of the lake below. He shouted out that there was a monster in the water 
and says that all the tourists in the area stopped to stare at the creature swimming in the calm lake. He immediately grabbed his camcorder and managed to capture the sighting on film. He says that when they reached the top of the mountain at around 10 a.m., the lake was covered with a thick fog and they were unable to see the water. Shortly after, however, the fog suddenly gave way to sunshine and that's when they spotted the creature in the water. In the footage, which lasts for about a minute, a black object is seen breaking the surface of the water three times in roughly the same area. Each time, it can only be seen above the water briefly, and after it dives down for a third time, it disappears and does not breach the water's surface again. He described the creature's head to be about the size of an ox and noticed that every time it surfaced, it caused huge ripples in the water, suggesting that its body might be massive. The lake is about 1,200 feet deep and legends of the monster date back to over a century ago. Over the last 20 years, there have been more than 30 reported sightings of the Chianchi monster and many photos as well as videos have been taken, but none are as clear as the footage taken by Zhang. The closest was a 20-minute video taken by a reporter from a local television station. He was on top of the mountain to film the sunrise when one of his guides spotted something in the lake. When he zoomed in, he realized that it was not one, but six of the creatures swimming together. He says they watched the creatures frolicking in the lake for about an hour and a half before they dove beneath the surface and swam away. He described them as having fins that are longer than their bodies and they could swim as fast as a yacht. The forested, hilly three acres of land just outside of Knoxville, Tennessee could be a park were it not for the dozens of dead bodies left in the shade of the trees. Some lie out in the open, others underwater, and others in cars. Most are wrapped in plastic or lie in cages. This isn't some sadistic criminal dumping ground. It's the University of Tennessee's body farm. Whether it's police detectives or archaeologists, there are a number of professions where understanding how a body breaks down in different conditions is crucial. So the body farm gives forensic scientists a controlled environment in which to study. It's unlikely anybody is going to be stumbling across any of the remains here. Not only is the area surrounded by fencing topped with barbed wire, all of the specimens are well marked. While there are some that are left uncovered, most are covered by plastic or cages and can't be easily moved. In some places, there is a smell, but it's not somewhere that reeks of decay. Those who work at the facility say that the pop culture image of the body farm is very different from the real place, but there's no denying the creepy images of those who have donated their bodies for science. Remains in various states of decay, becoming part of the forest floor as nature has its way. In a way, there's also something that could be considered quite eerie about how the bodies have become so detached to the people they once were. It makes sense that scientists don't put much thought into who these people were in life while examining what kind of insects are making use of the body now. But it can be quite disturbing to think about how divorced from the person these bodies now are. La Recoleta Cemetery in Buenos Aires looks more like a miniature city than any traditional cemetery. While most burial grounds will have gravestones and odd simple mausoleums, La Recoleta is filled with rows and rows of extravagant architecture built to house the remains of the city's wealthy and elite. The cemetery opened in 1822 on the site of an old disbanded monastery. It was necessity rather than aesthetics that prompted French Civil War engineer Prospero Catalan to design the cemetery the way he did. It was built on a marshy site and he feared a traditional below-ground burial would mean bodies would rise back to the surface during heavy rains. Instead, he outlined a grid layout over the 14 acres that would be used for the site. There are now more than 4,500 vaults in the cemetery, each varying in style and even construction material. Many can be looked into by visitors, 
Some have been well maintained over the years, but others look like something from a horror game, with spiders creating shrouds for statues that stand over the resting bodies. But it isn't only the general creepiness of being in a city of the deceased that makes La Recoleta a disturbing place to visit. Among the politicians and poets lies the grave of Rufina Cambaceres. Rufina was a young socialite in the late 1800s. In 1902, on her 19th birthday, she suddenly collapsed for an unknown reason. Three doctors declared she had had a heart attack and passed away. Her distraught family held a funeral and entombed her body in a mausoleum in the cemetery. A few days after the funeral, a worker noticed her coffin had moved within the mausoleum and seemed to be broken in places. The casket was opened and the worker made a horrifying discovery. Nothing had been stolen, as he had expected when he noticed the coffin had been moved. Instead, he found Rufina's body with bruised hands and head and scratches on the lid indicating she'd been trying to claw herself out. Rufina had been buried alive only to pass away due to exhaustion before she could be rescued. Elsewhere in the cemetery is the grave of David Ayano. David worked in the cemetery for almost 30 years and saved his entire life to be able to commission a statue of himself for his own crypt there. In 1915, the statue was finally finished, complete with a broom, watering can, and a ring of keys dangling from his hand. According to urban legend, David took his own life not long after and was buried in the cemetery. He said to still haunt the location where he worked, and visitors have claimed to have seen him walking through the maze-like paths still dangling his keys. Every day, millions of Londoners will take the tube to work, to hang out with friends, or to get home after a night out. Given the mundaneness of the task, most will simply block out the creepier aspects of the day-to-day -day commute. With only pitch blackness outside, the screams of metal on metal can sound like tormented souls being pulled to hell. Lights inside the carriages will often flicker, and often, trains will come to a stop in the tunnels below the city, waiting for a platform to be open at one of the stations. In these moments, the lights from inside the carriage illuminate the walls of the tunnel, revealing a somewhat eerie location. Londoners will ignore all of this, but some of the screams heard deep underground cannot be ignored. There are countless haunted underground stations, but Bethnal Green in East London is definitely the creepiest. The horrors date back to the Second World War. Many tube stations were used as bunkers during air raids. Thousands of people could be kept safe in a single station while their homes above ground turned to rubble. In March of 1943, the air raid sirens sounded and 1,500 people rushed out into the rain to take shelter in the tube station. Despite the fact the air raid was anticipated, there was nobody on duty at the station and only one of the doors were open. The new anti-aircraft weapons in a nearby park were in use, and many mistook the sounds of these weapons as German artillery. In a panic, a woman clutching her baby fell on the slippery steps that led down into the station. She grabbed hold of an elderly man to try to stop her fall, but only brought him down with her. The entrance was badly lit and many could not see what was going on. People tripped on those that had already fallen and within seconds, hundreds of people were being crushed. 173 people suffocated. It was the biggest civilian loss of life in the UK during the war. Afterwards, the government tried to cover it up. Newspaper reports were quashed as the government didn't want to hurt morale. But the people who lost their lives in the tragedy seem determined to make their voices heard. Today, many who have been in the station alone at night have reported hearing crying children and screaming women. The most famous story of the haunting tells of a worker who was staying late to do paperwork after the station closed. He heard children sobbing and women screaming, despite knowing no one else was there. He also heard a strange sound he could only describe as similar to people panicking. 
The noises lasted 10 to 15 minutes and he became so terrified that he fled to the booking hall. Walls lined with skeletons wearing traditional outfits, some with their heads bowed as if in prayer, while others seemed to stare out at visitors with empty eye sockets. It's hard to imagine a creepier looking location than Capuchin catacombs in Sicily. Thousands of bodies, some so well preserved that they look as if they are still alive, were entombed in the catacombs which saw its last new resident in 1920. The catacombs date back to 1599. For more than half a century before that, Capuchin friars were buried in a mass grave beneath the altar of St. Anne, but the grave had become far too overcrowded over the years. The friars decided to excavate a new cemetery, making use of ancient caves the monastery had been built on top of. When the new crypt was finished, they exhumed the bodies of the friars that had been buried in the original grave. To their surprise, they found 45 of the bodies had been so well preserved that their faces were recognizable. It was deemed an act of God and the bodies were put on display in niches in the walls of the new cemetery, adorned as relics. The natural mummification process from the dry cave system was added to over the years with a mixture of natural chemicals and salts. News of the mummification spread in the local community and eventually, the friars began letting average people be put to rest in the catacombs. Some would be placed in glass coffins, which could be opened by living members of the family so they could hold hands in prayer together. Others were put on display in the wall niches. There were separate rooms for different types of people. The friars from the church were placed separate from the average person. Those from a professional background had a separate room, as well as women, children, and infants. The mummification process did not come cheap, so it became a status symbol for the rich and elite. The catacombs were closed for new bodies at the end of the 1800s, but two exceptions were made. In 1911, a vice consul of the United States was laid to rest. In 1920, the most famous of the catacombs residents was interned. Rosalia Lombardo is sometimes called the sleeping beauty. Her body was so well preserved, it really does look as if she's sleeping, with only a slight purple hue to her skin indicating that she has passed away. It's not the most well preserved bodies that make this place so creepy though. Rather, it's the mummies with yellowed skin clinging to their bones, mouths hanging ajar as if silently screaming that'll send chills down any visitor's spine. To the Mayans, the cave was a sacred place, a pathway to the underworld where their god of rains and fertility resided. And so when things got tough, it was here where sacrifices were made to try to gain favor with the gods. The Actun Tunichil Muknal is a cave and one of a few government protected sites in Belize. It lies in the jungle, an hour's walk from the nearest road. To get access to the cave, one must swim inside and then wade up a river, but the view is certainly worth it. The large cavernous rooms have received nicknames like the cathedral. In some spaces, high-ranking Mayans would long ago slash their own hands to make sacrifices to the gods. But further into the caves, there lies the remains of much darker sacrifices. When the cave was uncovered in 1989, explorers found the skeletal remains of dozens of people, varying in age and gender, at the back of the cave. Many showed signs that their skulls had been bound in life to make them more elongated in shape. Most passed away due to blows to the head and were left there in sacrifice. None of these people had been buried ceremonially. Many were left on the floor of the cave while others were stuffed into smaller crevices. The most famous of the bodies is that of a young man who had apparently had a more violent end to his life. Two vertebrae were crushed and he was thrown to the floor of the cave. Over time, water running over the body led to calcification. He, like many of the bodies, became cemented into the floor of the cave leaving quite a disturbing sight for those that eventually discovered him. The calcification led to him being known as the Crystal Maiden, 
as his slight fame led initial researchers to believe the body to be that of a young woman. Today, only a few guides are authorized by the government to give tours. None of the artifacts in the cave, which include pottery as well as the remains, are cordoned off. This led to one tourist dropping a camera on one of the remains and crushing a skull. Camera equipment has now been banned. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you like this video, be sure to hit that like button. Also, don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell to keep up to date with all of our future uploads. But I've been Ty Knotts and I'll catch you guys in the next video.